quick, very, very quick recap. We looked at uh, some of the things concerning. Uh, we actually got into the 12th apostle replacement for Judas, but we talked about uh, the saving baptism of the Holy Ghost. This, to me, obviously, and, and to you, is probably the most beneficial one. This is the one that honestly saved our souls for all eternity. This is the one that sealed us into the day of redemption. This is the one that put us in the body of Christ forever. This made us members of his body. Uh, I like this one. I like knowing I have to worry about whether I'm going to heaven or hell tomorrow, or this afternoon or the next hour. Uh, that comes from this unique baptism called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, we looked in John chapter number 7. It's a great dividing point in your Bible. I don't, like I said, I hope you're a Bible marker in some, some regard. Maybe make some notes. Uh, we saw in John 7 that he said the Holy Ghost would be given when he was glorified. And that in your belly would flow rivers of living water. He also said in John 14, the Holy Ghost that shall be in you. So it's a future event. Well, now we're in Acts chapter number 1, your post-resurrection. They don't have the 12th replacement yet. We looked at it last week. We're not going to redo that. But I want to read this. And then go to Acts 2 in a couple other places this morning. The Bible says this, verse number 1, Acts 1.1, 1, 1, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, uh, quick side note right there, if you guys have done any research in other Bible versions, infallible proofs is not in there. Uh, if you have something that's infallible, what do you have? If it's infallible, can't be wrong, can't be refuted. Uh, I like the word, right, the, uh, the letters right after in, it's four letters that say what? Fall. It can't fall. It's infallible. Whatever God has proven to you and whatever He's done, you can fully prove it and prove it through. It cannot fall. I like that. Well, the Bible says this, infallible proofs being seen of them. Forty days of speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, command them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. And we, we, we look back at that. Even going back to what John said about his cousin. A uh, cousin that should come one after me that... He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We'll get into fire in the next week or so. You, you don't want that one, as I said many times before. The Bible says this, verse number 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they, uh, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, uh, you have a great reference to that over in Matthew 24, do you not? Nobody knows the day or the hour. No, not the angels of God, which are in heaven. So the Father has the power to say when that second coming is going to happen. Now we know because we have a complete Bible. You ought to thank God you have a complete Bible. You have shadows and similitudes, but you also have the facts of the Word of God. Of You, you could get a good, real good figure when the rapture is going to happen. You have a calendar for the second coming. You have, you have the calendar for the birth of Christ. What a, what a blessing to have God's mind on paper if you really want to dig into it and, and learn some things about the Father and, and the Godhead in, in your Christian life. The Bible says this, verse number 8, about uh, in his own power. The Bible says, here's the power that you're going to get, gentlemen, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. So, uh, what is the Holy Ghost going to empower these boys to do? What, what's, yeah. So I, I would say this right off the bat, that in kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit, is that uh, when you get baptized with the Holy Ghost, what is the most elementary, rudimentary thing that you're probably going to do? Now, if you just look back in your life, were you not probably a better witness when you first got saved? Is that trip typically not the case with us, that we're more zealous for our Lord when we don't know as much? Isn't it strange how we need to know that Bible a little bit? You get a little cold and damp. You shouldn't, but you do. You kind of get the facts to go with the zeal, and then the zeal wanes, and then the facts come to the forefront, and pretty soon before you know it, you've lost your zeal. I'd rather have you keep your zeal and I can teach you the Word of God, and the Holy Ghost can teach you the Word of God. Some of the men that are, are, are adept at that and have that gift can teach the Word of God. But if you lose your zeal, you're in trouble. I, and I look back at this passage right here with a little more, little more eyesight now, several years down the road, is that uh, the Holy Ghost wants you to talk about Jesus Christ to others. 
He wants you to witness. Uh, what's the first thing Paul did when he got converted on the road to Damascus? The first thing he did. Now, it's kind of a trick question. The first thing he did was what? He prayeth. Remember? The Lord says, Ananias, get up. You're going to find a man. He prayeth. What's the second thing he does? He goes and preaches Christ in the synagogues. Uh, you should kind of know that. That's your apostle. And if your apostle prays and witnesses, what do you think you should be doing? Same thing I should be doing. Uh, it's, not, it's not exclusive of the pulpit or uh, because you're a pastor that you don't pray and witness. Well, I'll just let the people do that. No, that's a sign of the Holy Ghost in your life, man. The power of that Holy Ghost working in your life. Well, look at the Bible. It goes on to say, Acts chapter number 2. Uh, Brother Bert, get verses 1 through 13 and then pray and then we'll move on down the road. The day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all within one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sun from heaven as, a, as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews devout man out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, mm -hmm. the two came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, one, uh, marveled saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein, wherein we were born? Mm -hmm. Parthians and Medes, and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Mm -hmm. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocked and said, These men are full of new <laughs> Yeah, I mean. You gonna pray, bro? Oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. That was such a long time. <laughs> Deb, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll lay hands on you later to deliver you from the devil. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, man. Heavenly <laughs> Father, thank you for the word of God. Lord, thank you for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Lord, thank you that we can be filled with any fact you command us to. Amen. 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 Yeah, amen. 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 If you guys are warm enough, Kenny, you want to kill that heat, please? You guys warm enough? You can't hear? Can you hear me or no? Okay. Or just the praying over over there? Okay. All right. <laughs> I, don't ask me. Don't don't ax me, Kathleen. I don't know. I, yeah, yeah, bless, yeah. Bless all the reprobates and Guido. All right, go to um, go to Acts chapter ten, please. I know we looked at this with the baptism of, of Peter. 
it'd be good to re regroup and go through this. Folks, I, I hope going through this, it's not just to, again, to give you a bunch of facts and all that stuff, or I hope it assists you in reading your Bible and rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, this stuff is instrumental in my growth as a child of God. It's instrumental in your growth as a child of God. You may not know it or realize it now, uh, but if you do any amount of witnessing at all, if you do any amount of talking to people, particularly in public, you will come across this stuff. It would be good to, for you to have it in your heart and in your mind how you can talk to somebody. Now, if they're going to just be belligerent about it and be nasty about it, then you have to use some discernment and say, you know what, we're not going any further, you're not going to listen anyway, so let's just shut it down. But there are some people that really don't know the difference between Acts 2.38 and Mark 16.16 16 and 1 Corinthians 12. They really don't know the difference. It would be good for you and I as children of God to be able to say, you know what, I have a chance to minister to somebody, I have a chance to uh, help somebody by what I have learned. Uh, this doctrine is not my doctrine, it's the Word of God's doctrine. Okay, uh, It's not even our church's doctrine in the sense of the Baptist. It is in our doctrinal statement, but it's what the Word of God says. I don't want to give you what I feel or think or what the Baptist church thinks or says. <laughs> what a wreck they are, man. I want to stick to what the Word of God says. This will help you in your, in, your, in your walk with the Lord. I mean, if you've ever, I don't know, have you ever run into somebody that's questioned whether or not you're saved for all eternity or not? Have you ever run into anybody like that? Have you ever had a tough time where somebody is taking you to Hebrews 6 and you didn't know what was going on in Hebrews 6? I mean, before you're all scholars now and well-learned in the Word of God and all that, has anybody ever taken you, or of, the, of those people that ever they were taken to Hebrews 6 and messed with you? Before you knew what Hebrews 6 really meant and where it doctrinally fit, did you not question if you were saved or not? When you went to Acts 2.38 for the first time, didn't it make sense to you? Because you just believe the Bible, and you're like, oh, they're showing me a Bible verse, and wow, that, it says, you repent, be baptized, for remission of sins. I mean, I believe the Bible. I at least have that baseline understanding. I believe what the book says. But then you start reading, and you're like, well, yeah, that is true for them then. And then you read about the other stuff, and you're like, wow, that's pretty wild that there's more than one baptism in, in, in this book, man. And it's good to know, like I said, if, if, if anything, it should stabilize your faith and your growth knowing this book is absolutely true from cover to cover, man. And the things that appear to be contradictory are not contradictory, they're complementary. Look what the Bible says to me, uh, can you get Acts chapter 10? We're not going to read the whole thing, if you could, please. 44 to 48. Acts 10, 44 to 48. A lot of key portions in the book of Acts, this transitional book. Go ahead. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, mm -hmm. as many as came with Peter, because of that on the Gentiles also were poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. That's pretty cool. Then he answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. Mm -hmm. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Now, isn't that weird? Uh, we looked at, uh, oh, a couple weeks ago, what would be the, if, if you're Peter and you just got done preaching at Pentecost, what would be the natural order of what comes next? Right. Baptized and then what? Receive who? What happened here? Well, James, what's going on? What happened here? They heard the word. Same folks at Jerusalem. They got the Holy Ghost and then what to happen? Then they got baptized. What happened in Acts 2? Heard the word. You know what you just heard. Get in the water. Get the Holy Ghost. If you're telling me that's the same thing, you're smoking dope. In a Christian way, of course. They're not the same. But we're going here because what, what was poured out in Acts 2? The baptism of who? It's the Holy Ghost. Well, what are these Gentiles now getting? The, what did Peter just say? These guys, these Gentiles, they of the circumcision look and go, they're getting it just like we did. That's pretty cool, man. 
All kidding aside, I'm a Gentile. I didn't crucify your Messiah. I know he died for the sins of all and all, but you know who God pegs for that? Specifically in 1 Thessalonians, the Jews killed him. And they used Rome as the button men, the Gentiles. I understand our sins put him on the cross. I, I'm fully aware of all of that stuff. But if you want to really knock it down to brass, to get down to brass tacks with it, he came to save his people from their sins. And they said, no, we want Barabbas. Oh, and by the way, his blood be on us and on our children. So God holds that nation guilty for the blood of his son. I understand everybody's, I, I, I understand all of that stuff. He died for sin, sins, and sinners. I get every bit of that. But I didn't put Jesus Christ on the cross specifically. I'm not really guilty for the murder of God's son. But yet I get in on the baptism that saves my soul like the Jews did. Like it happened to us, now it's happening to them. If you don't think your salvation is something special, you're too much on your TV and too much on that internet and not in that book enough to think about how great God has treated you and I that, honestly, salvation's of the Jews. What am I doing getting in on it? What am I doing getting in on the baptism of the Holy Ghost? But thank God I did. Thank God I did. That, that stuff is important, man. And when you just get molly, you know, molly grubbing around, thinking about you know, whatever a molly grub is, is that what you get in your grass? There's a specific kind of grub. It's a molly grub. I think it's down south, man. But I, when I first there, I'm like, molly grub. Molly grub. How do you spell that? I mean, is that hyphenate? Is it molly grub? It's, I don't know, man. But you get molly grub around, just looking around, you don't, you don't realize how great our salvation is and how wonderful it is that we because of the rejection of the, the way that it rolled out, it's phenomenal what we have today through Jesus Christ. It's unbelievable that you can go on the street and not tell somebody they have to go to Jerusalem to offer up sacrifices. <laughs> or wait for them to come out of Jerusalem and tell you about their God, the God of the Hebrews. I can tell them about Jesus Christ anywhere as much as I want. Well, it's all coming to pass in the book of Acts. Look at the book, uh, uh, chapter number 11. Brother James, got to put you to work, man. Uh, we're in the book of Third Hezekiah. No, yeah, see, there he goes. Yeah, you're like, yeah, uh-huh. Here we go, we're back on Thursday nights. He hates me again. All right, Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. That's it, man. I need you now. I need you to get a chunk of this, please. You good? Acts chapter 11, 1 through 15, please. All right, 1 through 18. Go ahead. Check. I did this last time. Stupid, man. Uh, Peter the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto him, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and when in trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descended, as that done a great sheet, let down from heaven at four corners, and it came unto me, upon the, which I had fastened my eyes. I considered and saw four foot deep, the, the four foot deep of the earth, the wild beast. Mm -hmm. Now you probably noticed this be your, before, I, ho I hope you have, and if you have not, well maybe it's a good time for you to maybe make a note. How many times did Peter deny the Lord? How many times did the Lord ask Peter if he loved him? It just keeps going back, that whole thing, you can't beat it, man. Keep on going. Uh, Caesarea. Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them. Nothing doubted. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me and were entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, 
Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He shall, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thou shalt be saved? Just quick, hit the time, hit the stopwatch for a minute. I, I probably blew by this. Does does everybody know what a surname is? It's typically a last name, family name. So his his name is really Simon. His surname is Peter. He's also called Cephas. Go ahead. And he began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said to John, whom you baptize with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Whereas much then as God gave them the like gift. That's pretty cool. Romans 6. So the Gentiles are now in on it. You see what's a big deal? I already know this. Folks, you and I probably witnessed to, out of, out of 10 people that you witnessed to in the course of a month or two, whatever, I would say probably eight or nine are Gentiles. I understand that we're all mixed up now and all that <laughs> craziness, and if you want Ancestry.com, you pay me 100 bucks, and I'll take you to Romans 5.12. And I can tell your ancestry, you come from Adam. And I'll take you to John 8.44 for an extra $9.99 a month. I can show you your ancestry. You're born in sin. You're a sinner by uh, nature and you're a sinner by choice. Who cares where you came from? Go to see Jesus Christ to get that thing taken care of. That's the lineage you want to have. So anyway, I, I know that's probably going to wreck somebody's life about family tree. If you want to know where you came from, it's pretty cool. But honestly, <laughs> I know where I came from, man. Uh, the devil and the first Adam. Uh, thank God for the last Adam. Thank God for the last Adam, man, because now if you're in him, which is through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, now you have eternal life. All right, Pauly, Romans chapter 6, please. You hear? All right. Don't begin all happy. Uh, Romans 6, 1 through 6, please. Romans 6, 1 through 6, if you could. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, are, as were baptized into Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness. Amen. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Might as well read verse 7, because that's a phenomenal verse, man. For he that is dead is free. Isn't that a great verse, man? As they like to say, dead men tell no tales. Well, dead men don't commit sin. What happens in your my life? We take our life back and make it alive. Therefore, we get that sin rolling instead of the power of the Holy Ghost. Anyway, that's a message for next Sunday if you guys want to steal that. The um, Bible's very clear right here. The baptism here in Romans 6, now this is probably going to get some fo folks upset, but the Romans 6 right here, 1 through 6, is not a water baptism. It's you're baptized where? Into who? Into Christ. It's a spiritual transaction. The old man is crucified. The new man gets up. He's in the likeness of the resurrection. Your, your, your similitude and your, your picture is based on the fact of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for our sins, according to the scriptures. It's found in Romans chapter number six. This is the saving bat, this is the brass tax, Pauline epistle, if you will, of being saved with the saving baptism of the Holy Ghost. When God, when you trusted Christ as your Savior, God somehow immersed you, baptized you with the Holy Ghost and put you in the body of Christ. It was a transaction you did not see. You may have felt it in the sense of uh, the, the weight being taken off your shoulders, that, that lifting of sin from you, that, that humongous just dark cloud that followed you around is gone because the Lord took it away from you. 
I don't care how young you were when you got saved. I mean, I mean, how old were you when you got saved, Mackenzie? Brother Bert, like one and a half, something like that. Yeah, I was six months old. You six. Raise your hand. I trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Seven. Seven. Jennifer, you probably. Yeah, you got saved what? One hundred and three. Yeah, third. So just last week. When did you get saved? That's questionable. No. People say, how can you get saved when you're young? If you know you're, if you're, if, if the law comes, sin's revived, and you, you know you're dead, that's when you need a Savior. Well, when does the conscience kick in? I don't know. You have a better chance around the Scriptures for that thing to kick in. Didn't he, didn't, isn't that what Paul told Timothy? And that from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scripture, where it's able to make thee wise unto salvation. That doesn't mean you're going to get saved as a young kid, but you know what it does? It flips the light switch on for you. You know how when you talk to people now, they're 20, 25, 30, 35 years old, and they're like, I, I, when it comes to sin? Yeah, you, yeah that, was, that may have been the Stafford fight song. <laughs> Put that to a kazoo, man. That thing was awesome. <laughs> but you know, you know why? No Bible, no scriptures. They're not exposed to it. Uh, like that guy yesterday pulled up in the car, man. I understand he was a sodomite, and he was, a, he was kind of a weirdo. And he goes, well, I, I, you know, I, I, well, well, what is sin? The bottom line was this. You just didn't want to realize, and it had nothing to do with you having you know, the, the whole perv thing going on. You just didn't want to take accountability for your sin. I mean, he came at the light, then he swung around and had to come by, and he always picked me for some bizarre reason. I don't know. It's like a devil magnet since I was about 19 or 20 years old. But uh, come by that time. But the bottom line is, this, he just didn't want to be accountable, or whatever it was. It was he. It was a he. He didn't want to be accountable for his sin. You know why? Because nobody had ever shown him from the scriptures in some way, shape, or form. I will say this: as a Roman Catholic, at least through the Apostles' Creed and a few other things, you got an idea that Christ died for your sins. You didn't get the full, obviously, the regalia of the whole Word of God, and it wouldn't have profited you anyway. You're a natural man; it wouldn't have mattered to you. But you got some understanding that your sin caused that man to die. You didn't know anything about the deity of Christ. You didn't know anything, but you know what? You knew that. I knew this. I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was. And I'd go, I'd go get the old Douay Reams off the, off, the, um, off the shelf, man, or the old RS. Douay Reams is a verse, 1582 is a version, or 1552. I always get that messed up. With the, the, the Catholic forerunner to the, their, their Bible and all that stuff. And I would read Revelation through. That used to freak the tar out of me, man. And I knew I was in trouble. But until somebody came with me, came to me with a Bible and said, you know why you're in trouble? Because your sin is a reproach to Almighty God. And then, did you get saved right then? No. Didn't get saved till 17 years old. When I was so, there, what's it? We used to go see my grandfather in this little hick town about six miles away. And there was an old beat-up barn with a sign on it that said the wages of sin is death. <coughs> And that stuck with me. And it stuck on me. And 26 years later, I got saved. I mean, you're a slow learner, but I mean, <laughs> it is weird how God, after the switch goes on, He doesn't doesn't say, you know what, you got one more chance, and that's it. You ever notice how long suffering God is? You ever wonder why Mick Jagger's still alive, or some of those reprobates that are just out there still? I mean, Journey's coming to the Excel Center. Journey's been around for like 50 years playing rock and roll music. Why are those reprobates still alive polluting people's... God wants them saved. Why, why does he just... After, you, after the light switch gets turned on, you, you, you say, yeah, I'm the sinner, and, and you don't, but you don't get saved right away. You wait 26 years or however many years. I waited to get saved, and God doesn't just say, yeah, I gave you a shot. No, just go to hell. I'm glad he's long-suffering like that and patient and kind. I'm glad he's like that after you get saved. But when you get into this whole thing about yeah, the, 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 the baptism, I mean... The baptism of the Holy Ghost, when, when you recognize you're the sinner that God says you are and you agree what the Word of God says, you trust His Son by grace through faith. You believe the gospel. It's a sin payment that was made in the atonement through the blood of Jesus Christ. You trust that by grace through faith, and you, get, you, you trust the Savior. You're saved. Well, when you got saved, those sins got washed away, but He did that. There's a lot of stuff when you got saved that God did. How about the circumcision made without hands? How do you explain that? That now the sins done in the flesh don't affect the inner man, the soul. How, how do you explain that? But I'm glad he did it. Well, it's the same with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When God, you got baptized, we'll get into it when we, get, uh, when we wrap this up, is that you got baptized afterwards, but that baptism did nothing for you, water baptism immersion. 
Uh, it just, it's a, it's an, it, it, it's a, it, <laughs> well, it's Jewish in nature, we know that, but it, it's, you're just testifying what the Lord did for you. And a lot of folks will go to Romans 6 and say, well, this is how we baptize. And then, no, that's spirit baptism, man. Point being is that God, when he saved you, he baptized you with, with something you couldn't see, the spirit of God. That's why, it's, that's why now you know what people do, and we, we've talked about ad nauseum, and I'm not trying to make you even further sick by my repetition, is that that's why people say, well, when you get the Holy Ghost, you speak with tongues. Because, what was that? It's like a peep from the, peep from the pigeon row, man. Beep! Beep! Yes. But I mean, you think about it for a minute. That's where all this stuff comes from. Well, you're not saved if you didn't speak in tongues. You, don't, you didn't see the transaction when you got saved. It was made without hands. It was invisible. Like I said, you may have felt it with the weight being, but nothing came. There was no, oh, from, there was no Shekinah glory coming down on you. Whatever the Shekinah is, I hope, I hope there's a lot of glory there. But I mean, they, you know, the heavens didn't open up and right down that motel room in Baltimore, Maryland, God didn't shine down on my forehead and say, you're my chosen now. But I know the transaction took place. I knew it did. Uh, don't you have a verse in Romans 8, verse 16? It says, the Spirit, capital S, beareth witness with our spirit, little s, that we are what? Children of God. Man. When, he, when, when, when God saved you, he put a marker on you for all eternity that said, you're mine. And he reminds you of it through that Holy Ghost every day. You didn't see that. You didn't have thunder and lightning rolling. You just know now from the Word of God that, thank God I got that baptism. That's what saved me from hell. If you got this baptism and this one alone in this day and age, you don't need to go under the water. You don't need Israel's baptism. You don't need John's baptism. You, don't, you need to be saved. You need this one. That's how important it is. But now in Romans 6, it says, now because you've been baptized into his death, uh, now walk in newness of life. You shouldn't walk the same life that you used to walk before you were saved. That's not baptism. That's not Baptist rules and regs and all that. You should not be the same person after God saved you. And I understand that's in the inside. We typically like to look on the outside. You're a new creature from within, but I know this. Those new creature habits start coming out. Uh, things that didn't bother you before, they start to kind of bother you a little bit. Man. And I don't know about your salvation experience. I, if you looked at me for three years, you'd say, no way that man's saved. No way he trusted Christ. No way he's a child of God. No way, no way, no way, no way. And I don't know what to say about that other than I'm ashamed of it. And I don't, won't talk about it. But from 84 to 87, there's just no, no excuse, man. Were you saved based on now what I know and based on what I trust on, who I trust on? Yes. Would you have had anything to judge between Christ? Absolutely not. But I got in on that saving baptism of the Holy Ghost. You see how this helps you is that you should not live like the devil after you get saved, but you might live like the devil. <laughs> it all depends whether or not you got in Christ and Christ got in you, and that happens through the baptism of the Holy Ghost when you trust Him as your Savior. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, please. 1 Corinthians 12. Brother Guido, 1 Corinthians 12. You, you, you want this baptism, man. You, you want this baptism to be saved from the penalty of your sin, man, saved from a devil's hell, lake of fire. Brother Guido, if you could, please, I need you to go 1 through 14, if you could, and, the, and then verse 27 to wrap it up. I'm sorry. Okay. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away on these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse. Mm -hmm. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Yep. Now there are diversities of gifts with the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations with the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh Amen. all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For the one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. That's Pat Robertson, Brother Guido. Pat Robertson. And then he knows when to break for a commercial. <laughs> well, that's the word of knowledge. <laughs> another faith by the same Spirit, another the gift of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles, to another 
prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man serving Amen. as he will. Amen. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Amen. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we bond or free, and have all been made to go drink into one spirit. For the body is not one, one member, but many. Amen. Now we are the body of Christ, and the members in particular. Okay. If you ever wanted a passage that... I don't want to say refutes, but defines what has happened past the Acts 2.38 baptism, and you get hunkered down in some good old Pauline doctrine. It's Romans chapter 6, and this one right here, and we'll go to one more as we close in Galatians 3. What the Lord just taught us and is revealing to us is that the day you trusted Christ as your Savior, He baptized you into the body of Christ. Uh, again, there are not multiple bodies of Christ. How many times did Guido read from the Word of God, there's one body? Somehow the Baptist brethren have a conniption fit. That's another one of the mully grubs. I don't know what a conniption is. I don't know. It's, it's K -N, I know knip knop when you played as a kid in the 70s where you hit the thing and the ball went through the... That's living, man, if you don't know what it is. And then if you lose, you smash it and go monkey rage. It's good for you. But I mean, when you... Kenny, don't be shaking your head, man. That's funny stuff, man. You all right, man? Oh, yeah, yeah, nice try. Nice try. He ain't reading. He ain't reading. He's like... But God puts you into His Son's body. So everybody from Acts 2 that has the baptism of the Holy Ghost is in the body of Christ. And they're not all Baptists. <gasps> As he falls back from the camera for dramatic effect. What a shame that is to think we're the only ones in the body of Christ or we're the bride and people like the Bogomiles. I actually thought about calling our church that or Cathari. That's what I really wanted to go with. How about the Cathari or the Waldensians, the people that actually really loved Jesus Christ and did something for them, uh, for him when they were being killed? Yeah, I do. I, that, that frustrates me. We have a different level of persecution. I understand it may not be all physical and stuff, but you read some of that stuff, you're like, wow. What do I do for Jesus Christ that really matters anyway? I get upset when people don't take a track from me. I get upset when my car doesn't start. And these people are like getting killed for just having one or two pages of the Bible. Are you serious? But to think that, well, this is a Baptist body. And then there's a Methodist body. Or there's another, you know, they're friends of the bridegroom. You're an idiot. The friend of the bridegroom is John the Baptist, an Old Testament saint. You're weird, man. You see how this stuff even creeps in? The man, you know, putting, you know what it is? Man putting his hands on it. Stay away from it. How's that sound? Well, anyway, back to that. That was just a little mini rant to get you going. That's, uh, there's only one body. And there's one head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are members in particular of that body. How does that happen? The saving baptism of the Holy Ghost. I don't know how you fit in the body of Christ. I don't know what gift he gave you. That's why we spent all that time on the gifts. But he not only baptized you, he gifted you. And your gift, the way God severally gave it to you, fits exactly how it's supposed to fit in the body of Christ. And when we assemble together in this assembly, it works together in this assembly. We can't all be preachers. We can't, or, or excuse me, uh, uh, pastors and teachers. It's not going to work that way. Some folks are more adept and more gifted. Quite bluntly, it, it helps. That's just the way it is. Or mercy, that's just the way it goes, man. Thank God for it. You don't want, you know, I mean, Brother Polly will do legs because he has to do legs. Or he'd look, around, look like Larry the Lobster. You know, he'd be all jacked up top, you know, and then you have like these little pins down there, maybe like, you just push him in the hip and he's like, he falls over. You need to be balanced. God can't make everybody a preacher or a pastor and teacher in the body of Christ. He gives every part of that body exactly what it needs. You wouldn't have all people have all mercy all the time and be all weeping and blubbering around people and all helps all the time. It's a, it's God mixed it up perfectly and properly and correctly as he saw fit. I don't know why you got the gift God gave you. I don't know. But I would just say thank you, Father, for the gift of eternal life, number one, and thank you for gifting me to go help somebody else in the body of Christ, a member in particular. 
I like that. What's the first four uh, letters of the word particular? You're part of the body of Christ. Why? The saving baptism of the Holy Ghost. Folks, that doesn't happen in the Old Testament. There's no such thing as the body of Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, you, you can look back and maybe see some shadows and figures and Song of Solomon and all that stuff with the, with the bride and all that. But boy, uh, you know who those mysteries are revealed to? <laughs> Our apostle. What a wonderful thing it is. I, I hope you get some glimpse of just how wonderful it is being in Christ. Or maybe not. Maybe there's something on Facebook you want to go watch or YouTube. I don't, I don't know. There's not, nothing I can do about that. Galatians chapter 3. Nothing I can do about that, man. I say that stuff out of frustration with my own life, man, where I get bogged down in stupidity, and I'm trying not to get bogged down in stupidity, and I have to talk to myself like this. And then when you answer your amen yourself, you're in trouble in the car when people <laughs> stare at you. They're like, what is this guy doing, man? Brother Jonathan, Galatians 3, 22 to the end of the chapter, please. 22 to 29. Amen. And we might be justified by faith. There you go. But after that faith is done, there are no longer, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There you go. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed. <laughs> Watch some transgender grab that and say, see, there's neither male nor female. That was Michael Jackson's life, uh, life verse. The, uh, so, <laughs> what he's saying is that you lose your distinction and your importance as, well, I, 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 I'm from Czechoslovakia, look at me. Well, in Christ, you're nobody. You lose your distinction. You know, over in Colossians 3, it's barbarian, Scythian, bond, or free. God doesn't care if you're a servant or a master. God doesn't care if you're Jew or Gentile. In Christ, you lose your distinctive characteristics from an eternal life standpoint. So I like that because that eliminates a lot of the boasting, you know, like it's going on in Corinth. I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas. No, uh, you know, Paul didn't die for you. Cephas didn't die for you. Jesus Christ died for you. That's why he needs to have the preeminence. He gets that when you get saved, or he should get that when you get saved, and that baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're, you're baptized into Christ. It's all about him now. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This baptism to me, I mean, I, I, I love, I'm, I, I cannot, I, it's 30, 38 years ago. And you know what? God has not slipped up one time. He's not taking it back. He's not forgotten about it. Oh, yeah, I promised you that back in Baltimore in uh, 1984, but, yeah, it kind of slipped my mind. Uh, yeah, you were in limbo for a few weeks there, but uh, we, caught, like, we caught back up on back payments. You're saved again. Isn't that weird how he just can do that for 50 years, 30 years, 30, and not forget? Well, he sealed you. He gave you the saving baptism of the Holy Ghost. He put you right in, he put you in the body of Christ. These, these fools about this, oh, wow, these fools about the... Uh, O-S-A-S, -S, once saved, always saved. That's the movement I told you about. That's the one, that's the stuff you sent me, the Facebook stuff, the snippet. They're calling it the once saved, always saved movement. That's a Bible term, man. If you're always saved because you know where? You're in Christ. It, now, here's the picture, right? He's our head. We're his body. If you could lose your salvation, what would Jesus Christ have to do? He has to do some surgery on you and cut a limb off, a finger off, a phalange, a, a, a tarsal, a whatever it is. I'll leave that to the doctors in the room. <laughs> I'm just saying is that people don't even think this thing through. Well, I just think, I don't care what you think. What's the Word of God say? You're in the body of Christ. Why? The baptism He gave you through the Holy Ghost the day He saved you. You're in that body forever. And for you to get cut out, he'd have to do some sort of spiritual surgery to cut you out of that body, just like you have a, an amputation. That should give you great comfort. 
but yet great responsibility. That because of the great gift I have, I am a debtor to the Jews and to the Greeks. But it's not like bearing down on me like, if I don't do this, I lose my salvation. No, thank God I'm so, so saved, I couldn't be any more saved. I just want to serve him because I love him. Folks, we're not going to understand how great our salvation is. I mean, I know we have a more sure word of prophecy. I, I believe that 100%. But the minute you go from this life to that one for real, thank God you got a glorified body because you probably come out of your skin. You know, like the Tom and Jerry up in the air with the eyes popping out. Ooh, oh, oh, got the foghorn. You'd probably lose your mind when you, when you actually see the glory of your Savior in that city. Well, I, I, I do owe him. I do owe him. End of story. And you owe him. But it's not like bond, slavehood, servanthood. It's I'm free to serve him. Because of the wonderful gift of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm in the body of Christ forever. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm going to close. I have to shut it down. Let me ask you a question. Anybody in this room, and I know we're a small congregation this morning. Did anybody here speak in tongues when they got saved? All kidding aside, did anybody speak in tongues? I don't know of anybody that has spoken in tongues in my circle, in my realm. I know a couple people. I, get around, I used to get around a little bit, not so much anymore. But I've never met, in fact, the one kid, Rob Lee, that used to come by and see me all the time, banging on my door, crying, football player, weeping. My aunt and my, and, and, and my grandma say I'm not saved because they never spoke in tongues. I said, well, I'll open the door. I'll make an exception for you, man. Come on in. Had a chance to lead him to Christ. Still serving the Lord as far as I know, down in North Carolina. But somebody put the pressure on him that you're not saved unless this happens. Well, we just explained it. When you got saved, a transaction took place without hands that you didn't see, you didn't even, maybe didn't even feel. But I know it because God told me, and then the Spirit of God says inside me, yeah, uh, you're, you're mine. Let's, let's get to work. Baptism of the Holy Ghost, man. What a wonderful thing it is. It's not Acts 2. Uh, it's not even really like Acts 10. It's <laughs> those boys spoke with tongues, too. So, Brother Jonathan, pray for us, man. Please, we'll shut down Sunday school. Amen. 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 Amen.